welcome everybody. There's probably nothing quite as topical as the subject of race today, racism and anti-racism. I'd like to thank, first of all, the Academy of Ideas. So we'll have, first up, Patrick, who is an OBE and has more <coughs> impressive official titles than I can name here. Uh, they're all in the programme. But for now, I just want to say Patrick's a non-executive director of Solihull ICS. Is that an integrated care system? It is. It is, yeah. And co-author of 100 Great Black Britons and is a Claw and Winston Churchill Fellow. And then after Patrick, we'll go straight over to Kunli Ololode, who's director of Voice for Change, which is a charity um, for, for black and minority ethnic people. And he was also co-opted co-opted on as a commissioner on the Committee of Race and Ethnic Disparities and thinks it's time for a new narrative around race. So what that new narrative is, or whether we actually need a new narrative, might be things we'll discuss in the after their introductions. So, uh, Patrick, over okay. to you. Okay, cheers. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're enjoying uh, today's uh, last two days uh, of Battle of Ideas, and it's a battle of ideas. Uh, and I think um, it's quite pertinent that we've got this uh, conversation uh, probably during the second week of Black History Month. Uh, and as you know, Black History Month was established 34 years ago uh, in Britain in 1987. And the people that were involved in advocating for Black History Month were anti-racist campaigners, people on the left, but also people concerned about the lack of representation uh, not just simply how black history wasn't taught then, but the wider issues uh, in Britain at that time, which I think are still pertinent today. So if you were to cast your mind back to the good old days of the 1980s, for those of you of a certain vintage, um, we had um, Margaret Thatcher was the, was the leader of the Conservative Party, uh, probably one of the most successful Conservative leaders of all time. Um, and um, during that, her reign, as, and it was a reign actually in many ways, um, Black History Month was established. She got rid of the GLC. Uh, a nemesis at the time was Ken Livingstone. You would have to boo his, you could do it later. But at the time, um, when the DL GLC was being dissolved uh, and all the assets of the GLC were distributed to a number of local authorities and the creative subsidiary company uh, uh, organization, um, a guy called Adesibo, who was then working for the GLC, um, had the idea of um, establishing Black History Month. He worked with a whole range of people uh, who are well known in public life, like um, Lord Human Oosley. By the way, his memoirs have just come out just recently, and I do urge you to get a copy of his memoirs. Uh, Lord Human Oosley was um, the first black person to be the chair of, of the CRE, Commission for Racial uh, Equality, who was chief executive of a Lambeth Council and for other senior roles. Um, you had Linda Bellos, uh, she was also involved. You had Bernie Grant, um, you had um, a whole range of people um, involved in helping to try and establish uh, Black History Month. And one of the reasons why Black History Month was established, and it's quite important to our conversation today about race, was um, the level of discrimination facing uh, particularly black people, but other uh, people, monetized communities as well. And the narrative of Britain at that time was um, based on exclusion, structural racism, and, and lack, of achieve, lack of recognition of, of the contribution of black people across different sectors, from the NHS to all variety of sectors. And the idea of, and the concept of black history month was very similar to the concept that was established by Carter G. Woodson in 1926, it was called Negro History Week, was about promoting racial pride, self-esteem, and confidence of black people, but also to educate and inform the black contribution uh, at that time in America, and when we had our Black History Month establishment in 1987 about black British history as part of British history. That still is ongoing, but at the heart of that uh, is a much deeper question, and the deeper question is about how do we see race? And we all know that race is a social construct. But over the last 20, 30 years, a lot of research work has been done, mainly in America, looking at the impact of racism on the black body in terms of our physical health, our mental health, a lot of research done around discrimination in, uh, in certain professions, from law to business, uh, uh, academia. 
and then discrimination in terms of the obvious stuff that we all know, um, stop and issues around stop and search, violence uh, as well. So the question has, is, how do we look at the issue of race? How do, we, how do we have a more egalitarian society where, no matter who you are, that you're respected? And one of the interesting things that the left has always been accused of and anti-racist is about political correctness. Um, and um, that you've been politically correct, you're, making, you know, you're just making up an excuse around your own ideologies. And maybe there are some examples where you might, that might be the case. But I think political correctness has gone the other way now. When you have a government minister saying that if anyone talks about white privilege, they should be reprimanded, or critical race theory um, is an ideology and, people should, and that should be banned, I think we've gone completely full circle around what is political correctness. Because political correctness, well, which we are facing now, is not allowing conversation, it's not allowing debate, and it's not allowing key lived experiences of black and minority communities. Last time I was here, I was actually challenged on the issue of uh, privilege. White pri I didn't talk about white privilege, but on the floor, people raised issues about privilege. And I can remember one guy saying, I'm from a white working class background. Um, I have no privilege. And, you know, it's all very well you talk about privilege, you know, unlike people in power. We all have privilege. All of you in this room have privilege. I have privilege. You have privilege. Colin's got privilege. You know, I've just been recently been made um, a professor at Wolverhampton University, so I've got a certain degree of privilege. But if I was to leave this room today and I was stopped by the police, you think that privilege would help me? I've got more chance to be stopped and searched by in, uh, in this room and by the police compared to most of you, basically. So the question around privilege, around representation, around tackling uh, racism is at the heart of the matter. Something that, as a country, we've tried to avoid for basically 400 years. And it's only been the last couple of years, I mean, particularly around the murder of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, that we started to have a conversation. The com whether the conversation has been mature enough, uh, uh, respectful enough, that's another matter. But at least we're having a conversation. And um, it's great. That's why I come to these events about of ideas. I might not agree with all the viewpoints uh, on various platforms. But one thing I do respect is the opportunity for conversation and debate. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs> so a, a good note to end on there, Patrick. Yeah. Thank you. And now over to Kunli. Thank you. Um, it's an interesting topic of discussion. It's also a very important uh, discussion uh, that today has taken uh, many different directions. And there are issues that Patrick has raised, which uh, I take contention with. But I think in this short introduction, uh, I just want to touch on two things. First of all, uh, the question of how perceptions around race have changed in the last 20 years. Uh, and then secondly, to consider what the factors are in relation to anti-racism. So I'm going to kick off with a quote from another professor, uh, Bikku Parekh, whose report, The Future of Multi-Ethnic Britain, was published in 2000. Uh, it was launched by the then uh, Home Secretary, Jack Straw, uh, and said, there was a tremendous national commitment to countering racism, of which the nation should be proud. And in fact, uh, the, the kind of <coughs> tagline of the report was about responding to the question of racism in Britain in the aftermath of Macpherson. Uh, and he went on to say that the suggestion that um, Britain is a country in which racism was widespread, uh, which emerged in the wake, as I say, of Macpherson, was wrong. In fact, Britain was a much more relaxed society than others, uh, such as France and Germany. Uh, he went on to say that um, if the report actually uh, took two years to um, uh, prepare, uh, and it was set up through the Running Mead Trust. Uh, there were people like the, the news uh, caster John Snow who were involved in it, uh, and many other uh, kind of uh, prominent individuals in the commission. But what uh, Parrott was very clear on, he said that the proposals 
that, they, that came out of the report did not mean that race relations in Britain were poor, but instead were designed to reinforce the country's position as a pioneer of racial tolerance. Now, to consider uh, today uh, the reaction to the CRED report, uh, which came out earlier this year, uh, it's very clear that something has happened in the 20 years between those two documents. Uh, they both came to very similar conclusions. Uh, the CRED report basically arguing that it is not the case that uh, they could find evidence that uh, the situation in the country was uh, in a, a set up to ensure uh, black failure and failure of my minority communities. Uh, I, as I said at the last session, the question of discrimination and racism is still a, uh, a potent force in our society. But the factors that determine uh, the disparities between uh, ethnic groups and racial groups is something that could indeed be the product of racism, but could also be the product of other factors, including uh, regional geography, including your position in the labor market, including uh, a whole range of different variables that we needed to isolate. My point at that time was, uh, in many respects, the CRED report uh, is open-ended. Uh, and I think there's a need to recognize further research and investigation in terms of understanding race relations today. But I think the, the, the nature of uh, the, the situation as I see it is we've got a very mixed picture. Uh, in some areas, you can see that, for example, in the labor market, uh, for uh, those under the age of 30, the gap between um, black and white has actually narrowed considerably. I think uh, in the report it indicates something around uh, 3%. But if you're talking about, say, an older worker, a uh, 40 plus, who works in a local authority, those gaps are still huge in terms of income and in terms of uh, uh, the aspiration for career development and uh, uh, you know, getting ahead. So um, I think what we need is a much more nuanced debate around race in terms of understanding how it impacts society. And that's what CRED aimed to do. And I'm not saying that um, CRED, by any uh, stretch of the imagination, was a perfect report. Uh, I very much agree, uh, in some respects, with the kind of uh, statement from Kenan Malik in The Guardian, which is that, uh, in a sense, it's a flawed report. But the basic problem that um, a lot of people on the left, and even anti-racists, are failing to confront is the fact that race, uh, as a phenomenon in contemporary British society, has improved over many, many years. Uh, and the indicators are all there. But there are obviously clearly areas where the degree of improvement uh, is not there. Uh, so if we look at something like stop and search, uh, the interesting uh, data that 60% of all stop and search nationally actually happened in London. Can you imagine? 60%. And if you then look at the data relating to how many of those stop and searches relate to people of color, then you can see that clearly there's a correlation uh, between where uh, uh, black and minority uh, people uh, reside and the, uh, and the impact of stop and search. The question of uh, unemployment I've also touched on already, but um, there are also, uh, in contrast to that, success stories that we also have to acknowledge. Uh, in terms of education, uh, certainly, um, if you talk to heads, uh, teachers of schools in uh, working class areas, they absolutely adore and love the introduction of refugee kids into their schools. Why? Because refugee uh, kids have been driving those schools up the league tables. They can't get enough of refugee kids uh, in the sense that what you find is that uh, people who've come from troubled parts of the world, when they get into the UK, they work hard, they focus on their studies, they want to improve their lives. And so that in itself is having a, a tremendous impact. If you don't believe me, go and take a look at the uh, schools in uh, Newham or look at the, some of the research work of uh, Danny Dawling <coughs> at Oxford University who reported the, uh, this phenomena, uh, I think as far back as 2015, that in fact refugee kids were driving up the um, results of schools that had previously been failing. Um, I think just in general, looking at the, the question 
of the characteristics of anti-racism and the factors that drive it. Um, I would argue, uh, and, and taking up from uh, where uh, Patrick left off, in terms of the historical examples, um, there's a very honorable tradition in this country of anti-racism, which goes back to the 19th century, from the Chartist movement right through to uh, the questions of challenging um, uh, Italian intervention into Ethiopia in the 1930s, even uh, as late as the 1968. People talk about Enoch Powell and the rivers of blood speech uh, and the uh, support that was gained from Dockers who demonstrated in support of Enoch Powell and those remarks. We never talk about, for example, in history, uh, the counter demonstration of Dockers who actually uh, challenged uh, that position led by Terry Barrett. I was uh, fortunate enough to actually meet and talk to Terry Barrett before he died about that demonstration and the organization of it. And I think that the uh, point that I'd like to make is that in terms of understanding what anti-racism could be, we also need to have an understanding of what has previously uh, occurred. And I think all too often in looking at uh, contemporary developments, uh, particularly in relation to Black Lives Matters and other uh, anti-racist phenomena, uh, we don't have the analytical tools to look back and see what was positive about those movements in terms of shaping unity and involving different sections of society in making that challenge. And uh, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you very much. We thank our speakers. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna come out to the audience very shortly, but I'll just have a few questions for both our speakers uh, first. And I'd like to put it to both of you. Um, do, I'd just like to dig out a little bit more what you think about um, what has actually changed with, with both racism and anti-racism? Do you think it's just like a quantitative change that it was sort of like existed a lot more in the past and now it exists less? Or has, um, has the kind of definition or our understanding of it changed? And similarly with anti-racism, how has that changed from being something that perhaps decades ago was something that would be used to call for a certain unity across color lines to fight racism to perhaps something now, um, well, actually there's no perhaps, to something now that is quite often explicitly quite divisive. Um, and feel free to disagree with me on that, but I'd quite like to know your thoughts. Yeah. So Patrick first. Sure. Yeah, um, I'd like to definitely address that point there. Before I go into that, someone's just kind of interesting that Conley talked about refugees, about refugee children driving standards. But if you speak to the same refugee children, um, where if they go to university, they are being now charged as foreign students in terms of tuition fees. So it's all very well to have uh, talent from different parts of the world driving up standards, but yet the nut class is British because of the hostile racist policy that still has an impact on lots of families today. So I think that's an important point. And in many ways, what Cunley shared about the CRED report, or the CRUD report, depending on how you want to see it, um, it's very selective in the evidence. So, by the way, you forgot to mention about the McPherson report, which talked about structural racism, which led to the Race Relations Amendment Act of 2000, the same time when the Parrot report came out, done by CRE. You forgot to mention the Lamy review, which looked at racism in the criminal justice system, and more recently, the um, Lessons Learned review, which didn't talk about structural racism, but it's about structural ignorance, about the failure of how the women's generation was let down. So, please, don't be selective about, let's look at all the reports and analyze the reports as opposed to being selective. But actually the best example of anti-racist I can think of to make the case for you today uh, is John Burko. Yes, the former speaker of the House in, in Parliament. Now, if you look at the history of John Burko, back in the 70s, he was involved in what was called the Monday Club, an extreme wing of the Conservative Party that believed in deporting people of colour, very extreme right-wing policies. Probably makes uh, Rhys Mogg kind, kind of tame, actually, in many ways. And he's, and he's changed politically. You know, you might not agree with his, his personally, but when he became Speaker, he did a number of things. There was more black representation in the Palace of Westminster under his leadership than ever before in terms of senior roles, senior appointments, and particularly appointing... Um, Rose Hawkins Wilkin, Wilkins uh, as the one as, as a senior spiritual leader for this country and for the Queen, a black woman, who had a church in Hackney when I was a councillor in Dalston. 
So you could, look, you could argue on one level that is success for her and it fits into the cred report around achievement. But you can also look at it from different perspectives from anti-racism where John Burko actually fought hard. This is, and this is what I heard from him and from others around him, making the case to try and challenge the establishment to have greater black representation. So in many ways, I see him as a great advocate for anti-racism, which tells you that society is moving. If you've got someone who's got a really particular viewpoint of the world and he's changed over 20, 30 years to be seen as anti-racist, this means there's hope for all of you and all of us. Okay, thank, thank you, Patrick. Kunli, your thoughts? Um, I think the shift really is about the question of uh, a material change uh, and a shift towards uh, race discussed as a form of psychology. And I think that um, there's no doubt that psychology does play a role in terms of the interaction uh, of distant so different social groups. But I think the one-sided um, nature of the discussion around race at the moment uh, lends itself to the discourse around white privilege. Um, and I think for many of us uh, who are certainly um, long before uh, I started coming to debates with the battle of ideas, uh, we were troubled by an understanding of racism which looks at the psychological realm almost as if it's um, immutable, that um, there is a biological determined uh, outlook that is shaped by people's, uh, the color of people's skin. And um, you know, it was interesting in what Patrick said about, well, we all have privilege uh, and there are different uh, levels of privilege. And, and I think that for me is the, is, is, is the problem uh, aspect of it, which is that if we're determining the nature of people's uh, uh, ability to play a role in anti-racism on the basis of uh, a biologically determined um, outlook, then uh, we have a problem because that has to be the antithesis of what anti-racism is about. The fact that so many people have accepted that uh, position for me is deeply troubling. Uh, and uh, I find that um, within the anti-racist movement, uh, we should have developed a much greater by now critical uh, uh, set of faculties to be able to uh, dismember uh, that, but also to be able to um, go the other way, which is to determine uh, through uh, research and analysis where psychological, uh, psych psychology does play a role in shaping people's outlooks. So I'm not dismissing uh, entirely what's being said, but I think the CRED report was asking a very fundamental question, which is can we actually begin the process of isolating those factors which determine uh, differences in terms of uh, outcome uh, for people. And that is, uh, for me, that is an, a really intriguing uh, idea. And if you're serious about anti-racism, the idea that we uh, don't uh, attempt to in some way refine and, 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 uh, and look at things with more precision in terms of understanding social phenomena, I think that is, is something that for me as an anti-racist has always been um, part of my own uh, philosophical outlook and, and determination to actually get to the truth. Thank you, Kunli. Um, so, we'll give them a... so there's quite a lot of quite complex points here. We've got can we isolate variables that determine outcomes, which is a kind of question for method of social sciences or how you get to know that social facts. We've got the question of psychology that is very interesting because that kind of seems to me to dovetail or touch on other discourses to do with perhaps a more therapeutic turn in culture and education, possibly, um, which could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on where you're coming from. And is it the case today that we've got a kind of even greater focus on colour? And you mentioned Black History Month, and I was listening to, um, to a programme about Betty Campbell, the Welsh teacher who was the first black headmistress in Wales. And she was told when she was a young kid that, you know, the idea of her being a head teacher would, she would face insurmountable problems, and yet she went on to do it. And yet today we have a situation where putting two children up on a stage in a school, one black, one white, to celebrate their hair 
is considered to be progress in some way, intellectual, educational, ethical progress. Um, I can't see it myself. Maybe I'm missing something, um, but over to you now. So if you take your hands up, we'll take um, clusters of a few and then back and then out again. The point about this is complicated. Good to see Professor Patrick Vernon, by the way. Um, uh, your work in Windrush has been outstanding. Cutting to the question, I think uh, anti-racism has lost its way. I got the top first in medicine Cambridge and did my PhD there. And um, I've had enormous difficulty getting a job, live experience. I'm afraid left wing um, anti uh, a, a bit woke, uh, I apologize. Uh, but the thing is, the intersectionality is an issue. But uh, when I met at Baxton, one of my heroes today. Yes, Calvin Robinson. Now, you may wonder why on earth Calvin Robinson is my hero, because I think he's actually hit the nail on the head, despite the fact I'm one of the most left wing people you can meet, and I'm, uh, I'm on the medical register. We have an issue of racism in the NHS. I don't think any amount of academia about psychology gets around this issue. Now, th there's a large number of referrals of Asian doctors and African doctors to my regulator, the General Medical Council. It's impossible to get around that fact. But on the other hand, Calvin Robson is correct to argue that there is an industry behind critical race theory. I admit that Robin D'Angelo's uh, titles, uh, uh, including nice racism, can be, can be inflammatory to anti-work people, but somehow we need to bring us all together to deal with this. The answer for dealing with racism in the NHS is not diversity marketing, going on of spending 80 grand, uh, that's the wrong figure, 100,000 pounds per disability managers in the NHS. I agree with Calvin Robbs there, is to get the regulator and get the workforce to, to not discriminate against black doctors and to get the workforce to employ black doctors. So I, I'm sorry, I, I, I adore Patrick to bets and he is outstanding. But I felt that discussion lost its way. It got stuck in academia, semantics, and really lost the plot from what is actually really happening on the ground to black doctors. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hello, um, speaking as a long-term anti-racist, I'm quite concerned now of the discussion uh, that actually seems to encourage division and encourage looking at our differences. Um, I think we're humanity. We should be looking at our things that we have in common, which is, um, I recognize there's injustice. I recognize there's, anti uh, there's racism. I do recognize that, I'm not stupid. But I think we're now at the stage with the discussion, especially with our youngsters, that we now should be looking, and I think there's, with. With due respect, with the black history, I think it's quite divisive. And I know that's quite a controversial thing to say at this moment of time, but I think there's so many, thi and, uh, so many things that we should be looking at. We should also be looking, as you referred to, as class, as where we're coming from, of, of economics. They're, they're the things that divide us. They're the things that also uh, cause people problems of doing well in society. I mean, the people yeah. at the moment that are going to lose their 20 quid um, universal credit, eat and heat, it's all, they're the people that are underprivileged as well. Do you know? And that's, that's what, that'd be my look, that focus. And I also would like to challenge the idea of white privilege for those very people. I mean, I, I come from a very working class background. When I was younger, raising my family, I, I was poor. And thankfully, things later happened that I'm okay now. And I was not privileged. I had no privilege. I didn't feel privileged. My children didn't feel privileged. So I think I would like to challenge that, 
challenge the idea of diverse, you know, uh, not diversity, of division. And also, I would like to throw in the debate, and I'm going to be, um, is the idea of anti-Semitism. Where, do, where does that lie in the realms of racism? Thank you very much. Um, just before we go on to the next one, I just want to quickly just say something, um, if you like, on the privilege thing uh, from a session this morning. Some of you may have been there, but Catherine Burble Singh made a very good point. I thought she, that she thought there definitely is white privilege, but there's also, you know, pretty privilege, there's tall privilege, there's educated privilege. We are all privileged in some way by being here in the room. The question I think is, is not so much whether or not privileges exist, but to what extent they're politicized and used to justify making claims on our material resources or cultural resources. Okay, the question is this. Why does the panel think that if we take the police force uh, by way of example, both here in the UK and in America, um, until recently, as we saw in the George Floyd case where the policeman went to court, uh, went to jail, have the police not been dealt with effectively? The McPherson report and so on and so forth. Do you feel there is a force protecting them? So let me give you an example. Barack Obama, when he was president, made reference to a young boy who had been killed by the police. And even though he made some heartfelt comments, was unable to really do anything about it. Thank you. Thank you. And then one more, and back, then we'll be back to the panel. Yes. Yeah. Is this one? All right. Yeah, no, just a very, I'm a social scientist, so I, um, just a quick question to Patrick. Uh, if I'm trying to measure systemic racism, right, how do I measure it and how do I falsify it? Okay, nice and sweet, thank you. Okay, so, got, so you two, Patrick and Kunli, you've got discrimination in the NHS, in the profession. Um, we don't need marketing, what could we do to address cases of discrimination? Uh, we've got discussion on, is Things like, are things like black history divisive and the police force and how do we measure systemic racism? So take your pick, um, Kunli. Kunli, first a few minutes and then we'll go out again for more questions. Okay, there's an awful lot there. Um, one of the areas of the uh, credit report's recommendations is to uh, mount uh, a wide scale investigation into the NHS and look at uh, racism. I think that the treatment uh, in particular of overseas doctors uh, is hugely problematic. Uh, uh, and certainly in terms of the um, introduction of the language uh, tests uh, that came in a few years back, um, I think it, it is deeply uh, offensive for many of them who clearly are capable of communicating uh, and speaking English. But uh, uh, I think the, the uh, Areas of the NHS in terms of the promotion, for example, of nurses, uh, the low pay of porters uh, and uh, um, staff is something that uh, in the aftermath of COVID, uh, I think serious questions do have to be asked about which kind of workers we actually value and how we value them uh, in, in this post-COVID, I suppose, period. Uh, and that's, I think, is, a, a, is definitely up for discussion. Um, but I would add to that, though, um, one of the things you didn't touch on, on in, in the question was the failure, uh, continuing failure of the trade union movement to address some of these issues, which traditionally would have been the way that many of these things would have been handled. Uh, and so uh, there is a big problem that we have in terms of, I think, the, uh, the reshaping of the labor movement and how we actually challenge racism. Um, many of those institutions, uh, and this touches on some of the other questions that have been raised, no longer have the influence or the leverage to be able to impose themselves on, on society. So I think there is a big question for anti-racism, which is do we, have the, um, do we have the organizations that we need uh, in terms of uh, a lot of this discussion? Uh, and I think that's a serious proposition that not only confronts um, uh, the NHS, uh, but many uh, parts of society. Um, in, in terms of the uh, question of black history, um, I'm a, I am myself, uh, I'm a trained historian. And uh, I know that in terms of the academic development of this country, there are huge gaps and holes in people's knowledge and understanding of how history is shaped and formed by ordinary people. 
Um, and that includes, by the way, the white working class uh, are excluded from that discussion. But I, you know, I have a particular interest, similar to Patrick, in terms of uh, talking about some of those issues. Uh, I mean, just in terms of preparing for this discussion, um, I looked at uh, things like anti-Semitism uh, and looked at the 1906 uh, Aliens Act, the first Immigration Act, uh, which was brought in against Jews uh, r running from pogroms in um, Eastern Europe, settling in the East End of London. Uh, and I was thinking about, well, was there an anti-racist response to what the Trade Union Congress at that time was doing in terms of campaigning for uh, tighter immigration? Well, uh, I looked around my own borough, Wandsworth, which um, was one of the areas of uh, refugees where, which welcomed Jews, which is why we have a, a road called Hugo, Huguenot's Place, and we also have symbols uh, of Huguenots in the boroughs, um, uh, 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 symbol, uh, the, the logo for the borough. So at every point where there's been crisis around race, there has always been an anti-racist response in this country. Um, and I, I could find many, many examples from the Chartist movement to the invasion of Abyssinia in 1935. You know, when Heli Selassie ran from uh, Ethiopia, where did he actually um, you know, come to live? He came to live in London because that was one of the safest places and where he uh, derived the most support. Uh, and similarly, I think, as I indicated, there is a long tradition of anti-racism, but that doesn't enable us. It gives us an insight into what we need today, but we have to, uh, hopefully, through this discussion, uh, be able to pinpoint what is specifically different about this particular moment in time. Okay, um, thank you, Connie. So just, if I got you right, you're saying that the, um, the history is, it hasn't just been exclusive you know, it hasn't been exclusive of black history, but of more broadly of, of, of yeah. other people, other people in society. So if we're talking about the history class. of the working class, yeah. well, black people made up the working class in this country. And indeed, some of the, one yeah. of the key uh, uh, individuals in terms of the fight for the vote uh, was Robert Wedderburn, um, the Ill illegitimate son of Lord Wedderburn of Scotland, mm -hmm. who, okay. if you go down to um, the, uh, I think it's uh, the church in the middle of Clapham Common, you can see on the plaque, his name is there, along with the other uh, anti-racist, Thomas Carlyle, uh, and the Clapham sect members who campaigned for the abolition of slavery. So, okay. you know. Okay. Do, do, before, before I bring Patrick in, can I just quickly ask a quick question of you guys for my own, I'll tell you why in a minute. Who's heard of Bamba Bridge here? Okay, so a few people have heard of Bamba Bridge. That's interesting. I say that because um, I'm a teacher as well, and I've kind of, quite sick of a lot of the materials that have been coming into schools like the kind of you know compare your hair type things um, and we've been we've produced some materials and in part of our research for that was um, one of our teachers who's I think she's a Yorkshire from Yorkshire originally she said but do you know about Bamber Bridge and I'd never heard of it and it was um, this little uh, town up in in Yorkshire which in the second world war had black GIs um, stationed there and there was sorry Lancashire. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, that's me wrapped up. Oh, she's here. Great. Louise is here. Thank you. Um, yeah, she's the teacher over there. Um, and it was a really such a fascinating incident. You think, why isn't more, why isn't more made of this? Because um, the black GIs were treated, um, you know, like, you know, inferiors by their officers. And the officers were like saying, you know, why are you going into pubs with white people and that? But the white, local white population were really friendly. And in fact, they, you know, they treated them totally equally. But what is interesting is that in, meanwhile, in London, in Westminster, the government were having far more cowardly discussions about how are we going to manage this? How are we going to contain them? And so, you know, maybe we should have, you know, black people can go into the pubs on Mondays to Wednesdays, but, you know, not on the rest of the week and trying to think of things like that. So there is this kind of class dimension as well. And it does really, you know, it just makes you wish you had kind of like better teachers <laughs> and more people <laughs> putting better knowledge into the curriculum. And then maybe we actually wouldn't need a Black History Month. We could just have better history, but yeah. uh, Patrick. Sure, yeah. Um, so just to answer some of the questions, um, we have to recognize that anti-racism is a wide spectrum. Uh, so class examples, myself and Kunle, we, we have differences, but we have commonalities. 
And I think that applies to lots of people in this room. There's a wide spectrum. If you look at the history of anti-racism, and I think uh, Kunle has alluded to some of that history, it's a wide spectrum. All of you may see yourself as anti-racist, but you might, not believe, you might not agree with certain aspects of anti-racism. And I think the key thing I'm really keen, that's why I come to these events, is are there commonalities between anti-racists, whether you have a, a left-wing perspective or a right-wing perspective, one of the key essences of anti-racism is about rights and justice, yeah? That's the key, it's not about, yes, so there are elements around ideology, there are elements about people might see using critical race theory, but the heart of anti-racism is uh, about rights and justice and emancipation. That is the heart of it. And, and I think we've kind of lost some of that in many ways over the last decades for, for a whole variety of reasons, basically. Um, but one of the key things, which, but privilege is part of that process. And I said this before, all of us in this room have privilege. But if you're a black and brown person, you have less privilege. And that is a reality, it's a fact. And the gentleman that raised the question, where's the research work? Ironically, more research work's been done in America on this issue than in Britain, basically. So, for example, um, David Williams, eminent professor at Harvard University, ha uh, has done a lot of research work looking at the impact on racism Can I on, on people's physical health conditions, such as diabetes, cancer, and mental health. And it's quite clear there's, there's an emergent evidence about the impact of structural racism on black and brown bodies, which, unfortunately, the CRUD report didn't even go, go there, unfortunately. In terms of the wider question, how does Shipley, Shipley, um, in terms of the wider question on the NHS, I know a bit about the NHS. I've worked for the NHS. I currently sit on the board of a number of NHS organisations. I normally quite use the word there's industry uh, around. The only industry I see um, is senior managers moving from one part of the NHS to another part of the NHS. That's an industry I see. I just, if you talk about, remember, the NHS was established in 1948, at the same time. Um, as the Empire Windrush docked uh, in Tilbury. And um, people from black and Asian non ethnic communities have been at the beginning of the NHS in 1948. And you would expect after about 73 odd years, you'd have more people of colour in senior roles. We should have loads of medical directors, directors of nursing, chief operating officers, etc., etc., etc. But the NHS, which is the biggest employer in Britain and the third largest employer in the world. If you look at the, its representation at scene level, it's woeful for the amount of, and, the, and it's the biggest employer for people of not of the communities of Britain, and it's very woeful. I mean, by the way, that applies to other sectors, such as uh, the civil service, uh, even education and universities. So we've still got a long way to go because there's still, at the heart of it, is issues around structural racism. The other question I think that was raised, um, again, was about the Met Police. Now, it's interesting about the Met Police um, because, you know, there's been a checkered history with the Met Police on the issue of race. Um, so, obviously, the McPherson report was, was looking into the murder of Stephen Lawrence and how the police basically covered the tracks and suppressed the evidence and let off those killers, which most of them are still at large, by the way. But, uh, and then there were no, the McPherson report came with some key recommendations which was adopted by the government, adopted by the then commissioner of the Met Police, and there was an action plan and a strategy, and then later on we had the Act of Parliament, Race Relations Amendment Act, recognising public sector quality duty, and also recognising institutional racism, not just in the NHS, but a whole range of institutions. Within about three years after the passing of that act, you know, and this happens all the time in, in issues around race, there's a rear guard reaction, people said we're not really racist, and now you've got the likes of Krista Dick saying, oh, there's no structural racism, you know. Okay, I'll stop this. Um, there's no structural racism, but it still exists. It still exists even today. And misogyny as well. Okay, thank you. So let's take some more of you. Um, just while we're having this discussion, um, Kunli made the point about what's changed over the last 20 years. I just want to ask a really basic point, which is... What do we think the goal is? Because, Patrick, you've just talked about justice. But I'd like to just clarify whether we actually believe equality is actually the goal anymore. Because that was the basis around which I got involved in anti-racist politics when I was younger. The reason why I asked that is I heard a discussion this week. It's American, so it might be different. But I'm just interested in your view. 
And it's, uh, I want to put it on the table because this discussion is going to run. It's not going to just be today, it's going to mm. go on. So I'm putting it on the table. It's philosophically, it was a discussion about equality, universal, and the particular. And the idea is, in America, this person asserted that they're not sure anymore that they believe that equality is the goal. Because over time, as we get more and more focused around our particular difference, the idea of fighting for equality, she no longer believed was necessarily her desire. The issue was about how do you negotiate, and it sounded more like a role for the state, to police the uh, way that people interact in society between each other where there's difference. That to me is really worrying because what it suggests is that we're not really talking about an anti-racist movement fighting for equality, but we're talking about the state negotiating conflict between conflicting groups. Therefore, I'm just asking to clarify, is our goal still equality? Thank you. I think that's a really important question you've raised there. I'd love to hear what, what people think about that. Uh, my question to the panel is, would they agree that Brexit and the Brexit campaign re-resurrected racism, not alone uh, against black people and Asian people and other foreign people, but also against the whole European nations? Because the whole attack on the European nations, on the Europe, European politicians, was racist. The attacks on Ireland, on Irish politicians, that was racist. And the attacks on Scotland and on the Scottish politicians, that also was racist. Uh, and the, um, I think that the debate should be brought in to bring in other people who have suffered racism. Because the Irish people, we have suffered racism than any longer than any other race. And all of the, <coughs> the statutes on the books of England are all discriminatory against the Irish, against our religion, uh, against being an Irish Republican, uh, and all that. That is uh, appalling racism, and it's hardly ever mentioned. I am the chairman of the Irish Civil Rights Association, and thank you, madam, for allowing me to mention it. Thank you for making your point, sir. I think you're quite right. The target of racism isn't fixed. It's been Jewish people, it's been Irish people, it's been working class people historically, and more recently in Britain, it's been black and Asian people. But right. So as of 2021, the UK Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities reports that a person of color is five and a half times more likely to be arrested for drug possession than a white person. About 86% of the weapon possession arrests are ethnic minorities compared to 14% of the arrests that are white people. The same people that oftentimes are called racists are the same people that are bombarded with news that portray the unfortunate statistical reality of the social problems of certain ethnic groups. Instead of attributing all the responsibility for the completely inevitable people's negative view of some ethnic ethnicities, what is the responsibility that we have as individuals to represent our ethnicity, our community, and our culture positively in, in face of society? Okay, thank you. Um, the person in front, please. Yep. Yeah. Hi, um, I wanted to uh, make a point, uh, first of all, about you, you said something about white privilege and that the government had said that you're not allowed to teach white privilege, which I think you know is not either, I, I believe you know that's not true because you're an intelligent person. A bit of a I, didn't, I didn't say that. Yes, you did. You I, said I, they, they've suppressed people teaching white... Uh, no, you said you're not no use the to language of white privilege, I said, not yeah, teaching. That's right, a Tory politician said that. Yeah, what so he said did you, was, do, you, do you just want to no, get no, to the main question? Yeah, the main I, question what he said, what they said, you're not allowed to teach it uncritically. So you can right. teach white privilege. You're not allowed to go into a school and say, because you've got white skin, you're privileged. And because you've got black skin, you're a victim. And, you, yeah. and that's because in this country, we, the, the, the value, and I think it's a really important value, is individualism. You don't know if I'm privileged, that I, but I believe you think you do. Because, because I've got white skin, you can sit there and think, he's privileged. And I can think, because you've got black skin, you're not privileged. But I don't know. Have I, to I didn't, sit down I didn't and talk say that. Yeah, can I just finish my point there? You can say that afterwards. Yeah, yeah. You can see I'm a bit I'm pissed sure. off. Because, uh, yeah. I no, I'm not pissed off at all. Yeah, Patrick, yeah. Hang on, I'll bring you back in. Well, let, let the man finish his well, question. Okay. That is the whole concept of what white privilege is about. It's anti-individual. It's about if you, the colour of your skin determines who you are. So if you, if you look at somebody 
with, with white skin, you say, you're privileged. This, is, this, this has been going on in schools. And, and the Tory, I think Kemi Badenoch is the one that has stepped in on this and said, you can't teach that uncritically because that is racism. And we don't teach racism in school. We can talk about racism, but we shouldn't be teaching racism and enforcing racism in school because we're individuals. We believe in the concept of individualism. Sit down with a person and find out. Everyone look, is everyone look, I feel like I'm looking around and people are confused, like, what's he talking about or something? I don't know if that's just in my head. But this is a simple thing I put on Radio 4. And uh, I, I give it about two or three... If I hear racism, then I turn it off. If they're talking yeah. about because someone's white, they're privileged, or because someone's black, then I turn it off. Because uh, I think what we need to get back to or go forward to is judging people on the content of their character, not on the colour of their mm. skin. <clears throat> thank, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to allow Patrick to... Because I think... I, I take your point completely, and you know, white privilege being bounded about a lot, but I think you may have misunderstood what Patrick yeah. said about white privilege. So I was talking about two issues about um, political correctness going the other way. So I gave an example of critical race theory, what, particularly what Kim and Benedict said, that it's a political ideology and it should be banned. In, should be banned. And the yeah. statement made by Conservative MP over the weekend that people shouldn't be using the word, the word white privilege. I was just making a distinction between the two. But the, just to build on the various points that's been raised, to be quite honest, you know, anyone wants to be judged on their merit, or their contribution, their talent. But the reality, but, uh, but the reality is that we still high, have a high level of discrimination. So look, let me ask a simple question. Who runs this country? Who runs all the top FTSE 100 companies? Who runs local authorities? Who runs the NHS? Is it inclusive and diverse? And, and to the point that you raised um, about um, the debate, I think the debate that we're having now is not, equality is still there, but people now talk about equity. So the classic example, has anyone seen that diagram on the internet of um, uh, three children watching a baseball match? There's a big fence, they can't see it. One person can see it naturally because they're tall. One person can just about put the head above the fence and the other person can't see anything at all. The next image is there's a box, so one person stands up. But the final image is you, you remove the fence and everyone sees that. That's what we should be working towards as a society, as a nation, to remove those barriers where it's sexist, homophobic, hom whatever it is, so everyone has an equal chance. And that is the heart of fighting anti-racism, basically. Whereas, and that's really, really important. I think there seems to be something emerging here, which is there seems a lot of people, including Patrick, a lot of people agree with Patrick in this idea that we do want some kind, a kind of equality of access, yeah, that people should not be disadvantaged um, when applying for pub, any place, in public office or public roles and in civic life more generally. But at the same time, what we see emerging today is, I think, something different, and it'd be really good to tease this out, which is a shift not just to redefine race in terms of psychology, um, not just in terms of psychology or just even necessarily particularism, but it's being politicised, right? I, I, I mean, my, my just I don't usually like using anecdotes, but I will just to illustrate. I mean, my, my family are Indian. Um, and I feel I've never felt more conscious of my skin colour today than I was 11 years old and a boy in the playground called me the P word. And it's, and it's kind of like I feel that this discussion about anti-racism in particular is kind of being weaponized in a way that is... Um, so it's kind of not about discrimination. It's not about material discrimination. It's not about the things the gentleman at the back was talking about in the NHS or you're talking about, Patrick. But it's a kind of cultural delegitimization of, um, of the established norms, of, of the majority norms and values. Now, some of them may be worth criticizing, right? Not all majority, just being part of the majority doesn't necessarily make you right. Um, but it doesn't necessarily make you wrong automatically either. And I think that's the kind of tension I think we need to begin to think about and tease out a bit. But I've allowed Patrick to speak. So, Kunli, do you want to quickly say something before we go out again to the audience? We've got half an hour, so. I think um, the question of privilege, which has uh, now become uh, something that has been focused on, uh, the disaggregation of it and the critical analysis of it, I haven't seen that coming across. And I think 
there's a need for a much more critical uh, uh, examination of what we mean by privilege. Uh, one of the things I've noted, um, being the uh, chief executive of a, of, a, of a charity, is the number of um, uh, undergraduates doing masters in um, race and society who are coming to me uh, wanting to talk about um, uh, colorism uh, and the way that the notion of privilege in the way that Patrick also uh, kind of alluded to, that different uh, levels of privilege between people of lighter skin shades and darker skin, uh, skin hues. You know, the, for me, it, was, it kind of freaked me out when I was getting all these emails from, as I say, undergraduates doing master's uh, dissertations in colorism. Now, where has that come from? Uh, it's come from uh, an idea that this notion of privilege, uh, again, uh, as has been alluded to, uh, is something that it interacts with relationships on a, um, on a whole range of different levels. So at the fundamental level, we're talking about white privilege, but there's a whole set of other um, uh, kind of uh, levels in terms of how this discussion is manifesting itself. And that, for me, is, is hugely problematic in terms of of trying to shape a coherent anti-racist response. Thank you, Kunle. Yeah. Um, yeah, this okay. is a question or, or a pointer for Kunle, and it was regarding the, um, the CRED report and offering caution, like, like Patrick did, about just one report or, or various reports, because often or not, they do not um, reflect the actual trends that are happening in society. You mentioned about... Uh, amongst the under 30s, the gap between workers is, is narrowing. Well, that doesn't take into the fact that in, over the years, there's been massive increase in precarious work for both black and white young people. You know, on the streets, oftentimes, when, you know, charities are, are um, wanting money, you'll find black and white young people together, um, um, uh, 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 basically... Uh, uh, doing those sort of jobs and massive precarious jobs and also the casualization and in, in education for example where they want you young they want you fresh they want you not knowing nothing about anything so that you don't quibble when they're giving you all these flexible hours of working around the clock and and everything like that all your rights are completely you know they want you fresh and and, and, and to burn you out, which they can't do to people over 40 years of age. And okay, then over 40 years of age, we've got um, a, a, a large black unemployment uh, uh, there. It's, but, but I would question that you'd have also a large white un unemployment there because they're not looking for people who know their rights. We're looking, we're, we're in an employment environment where it's about fire and rehire and where uh, people's backs are against the wall and people are, are, are losing their jobs hand over fist. And they're giving these jobs half the money that they would have paid to someone over, over 40. They're giving them a fraction of that money and expecting them to work the job of free people. So that's, um, I think you are missing out when you just look at a report and say, oh yeah, you know, can't find no evidence of racism. There is racism there, you know, um, in the hiring, no doubt. But um, it, it, it is a mixed bag, and it's something that affects, yes, black people probably doubly, but um, uh, 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 obviously this is a fight of black and white uniting fight for me um, on, on this. Thank you. Hi. Um try my best to be brief. Please uh, do. <laughs> but I can't promise anything. I think... <laughs> I will shut you up if you go on too yeah, long. Yeah, <laughs> you should. Um, I think uh, Professor Vernon, and I say this with all respect uh, to yourself, your entire thesis is based on a fallacy. And this fallacy has been debunked in the 1960s by a black genius called Thomas Sowell, and you should read his books. The fallacy is that disparity equals discrimination. That is not true. We live in an 86% white majority country. It goes by logic to say that the vast majority of people in leadership will be white. If you go to Nigeria, the vast majority of people in leadership in Nigeria will be black. If you go to Iran, it will be Iranian, etc., etc. And 
you are assuming that people with different histories, different backgrounds, different cultures, different tastes will all be equal. By what logic, as the great Eric Kaufman said earlier, what is the metric that will lead you, get, get you there? If people in America, and I know that uh, study that you mentioned by Professor Wilson, you should probably read Glenn Lowry's, Professor Glenn Lowry, who's a much more esteemed professor, responds to that, and he debunks it completely. Um, the culture the, in America that the, the vast, if, sorry, fastest growing economic group are black, um, uh, sorry, um, Caribbeans. Uh, they, they earn the most uh, in terms of who's fastest economic growth because they are different from Nigerians who are also the, most, the ones that are excelling the most after Asians because different cultures escalate at different things. But if disparity is equals racism, then can you name me any institution in the world more racist than the NBA? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, I think it's quite interesting to talk about privilege. There's, in my view, my humble view, there's uh, privilege, um, you can miss what it, or for myself, what it really means is have self-esteem. If you esteem yourself, that's a privilege. If you love yourself, that's a privilege. No one wants to mention that because it's too deep, which is fine. But if you love yourself, trust me, you've got some, you've got some privilege there. Another main privilege is not mentioned by Patrick, but maybe I missed it out somewhere, maybe it's in the research, um, is regards to having a father. I never had a father. Eustace man, didn't know him. My mother has to do certain things to get money. That's not mentioned at all about what you need to do to get money because you're poor and your father's useless. Now, people like Patrick, I mentioned that, they want the state to do it. State, state, state. Blame the state. Never blame the individual because the individual can't think for himself. Little black man over here can't think for himself. So I can't blame my father for beating my mother. I can't blame him. No, 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 no. I can't possibly do that. How can I? How can I? How dare I blame my, my father? He had no choice. He had to beat my mother. He had to let, let us starve. Because, well, that, 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 that's what he, he was. And what I, what I dislike about um, the people, not, not no offence to, to Patrick, no offence at all, is they never talk about responsibility and the privilege of responsibility and the privilege of what it's like to be a father and how important it is that more, not just black, but about black people here, more black fathers stand up and say, you know what, I'm going to be a real father. I'm going to look after my kids and not put a Bentley first, not been having the rings first, not having bitches first, but my kids first. But you see, those on the left, the BBC, Sky News, will never mention fathers because they don't want black people to get real privilege, which is the privilege to be able to say, you know what, I grew from a loving family. I grew from a loving family. They don't want that. Thank you, sir. Um, I mean, I think it's just worth remembering after, um, after that point that there are plenty of people who do have fathers and who, who don't do very well and who don't uh, have good outcomes as well. Thank you all. Um, I have another question regarding privilege. And just, just to start with my, with my own lived experience, my um, parents came to Europe because they wanted to live in a democratic and free society. And when we look at the world through the lens of privilege, which is one way, not the only way, but one way of looking at things, indeed, I agree that all of us, we have some privilege. Arguably, I have middle class privilege, I have male privilege, etc. But I think it's unhelpful when privilege is used as a rhetorical tool to shut down democratic discussions, saying that, okay, you have privilege, you shouldn't be talking about that. My understanding is that every human being in this democratic state should have the right not to be subject to, for example, police violence. It's a right, it's not a privilege that should be criticized. It's a right that should be extended to everybody. To, to move this to a more productive question, should we reframe this as a question of actually living up to the promise of equal rights, rather than criticizing people for their privilege? Thank you very much. Thank you, great point. Um, I want to allow our panellists now to come back on some things because there's been an awful, awful lot out there. Um, say sort of two to three minutes sure, each yeah. and then back out to the audience yeah. for another round. Okay, so okay. obviously we, privileges come back again, so it's probably my fault. But anyway, it's cool. <laughs> uh, that's why we're here. But I'm talking about privilege in the context of power. 
I'm not talking about privilege and individual privilege. I'm talking about how privilege is used often in terms of discriminatory ways against people. So it's not about individual privilege per se, it's how, how people use that privilege or not in, in a very discriminatory way. That's, and, that's a, and that's a difference, basically. And going to the brother over there, um, uh, hello again, because I think you spoke last, last <laughs> raised the questions last time. You had a standing ovation this time. I don't know what happened today. But I'm happy to have a de I mean, debate about responsibility is a big issue. There's lots of debates in the black community about res responsibility. You know, I'm part of a network called, called Black Men for Change. And we've had big conversations about the very issues that you've raised today, big personal issues. And you're quite right. It's not, yes, the state has its responsibility, but we have to take action as well. So there's, these conversations are happening all the time within the community, and I, I encourage you to get involved in those conversations and those debates, basically. And often it's those conversations in safe spaces where black men talk about these things, basically. So it's not into me. So these things are happening all the time. Um, the question, the gentleman there that sort of um, said um, about the question that I'm deluded about issue on disparity. Disparity is impact and a consequence of uh, the history of capitalism, racism, call it what you like, basically. And I'm not trying to say that in, today in Britain that um, every, out of the 300 NHS organisations that form part of the NHS, there should be every black or brown person running those. The point I was trying to make is there's a significant number of us that work in the NHS. We've been there from the very beginning, and you would expect, based on merit, based on ability, that they should be given the opportunity, but they don't because there's lots of barriers uh, in the way. That is why in 2014, within the NHS, they launched the Workforce Race Quality Standards because there was a high degree of bullying, discrimination, and harassment, and they had some metrics to building to measure every single NHS trust body. So on an annual basis, every single NHS trust, that's a hospital trust, children's hospital or a mental health trust, or a commissioning body, have to produce data to see the progression, the career progression, measure little, um, evidence of bullying and harassment. And the reason that was put in place is because it was recognised that there are structural barriers preventing black and brown talent to progress. And that's why it's there for. I think the issue um, is, it's interesting because we all make these comparisons with America and Britain, that Britain's different, Britain's not as bad as America. But with all due respect, folks, where did the Mayflower come from? Yes. Where the, you know, and you have to remember that Britain was, was the number one leading slave trading nation in the world. And that's a fact. And there's a fact that we don't acknowledge. It's a fact that, it's, that all the assets and the wealth that even today that's still regenerated in our economy is from that. And, going back, and, for, and I forgot to respond to the gentleman over there from the Irish Protect Society. There's, there is a long history between black people and Irish people because we know it, we feel it, we have the same experiences of discrimination, basically. And what's, what's interesting is that, actually, I've had the opportunity of going to Belfast and, you, and if you go to either side, the Catholic side or the Protestant side, their heroes are like Frederick Douglass. They recognise the, the links between fighting for emancipation is, a, is, is, is an international thing. And that's why Black Lives Matter has become a global phenomenon, because people can identify injustice, people can identify discrimination, and it goes back to the conversation I had before. People now are looking at the issues of equality, but it's now it's about equity. Equity is about making sure that if you are talented, you're working hard, very similar to what the credit report was saying, that you should do well individually. But the reality is we still have structural barriers that is still here today, and we need to tackle those structural barriers if you want talent to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Just before, just want to quickly say, um, there's a session after this on history wars, and I'm sure um, and uh, maybe questions of colonialism and mm. that might come up then. So good to focus on race. Patrick, I just want to quickly just ask you something before I bring in Kunli. You see, I read something recently about the lack of progress made to higher levels within the medical profession. Yeah. Um, but what it seemed to me from this was that it wasn't anything, it wasn't structural what it was, was it actual individuals who were being quite consciously prejudiced, right? They were consciously overlooking people. And it just seems, 
overlooking people, and, and the, in informal ways, like sidelining when it comes to looking at promotion or having interviews, but then not offering um, feedback or constructive feedback or mentoring kind of programs that were offered mm. to some people, but not to others. Sure. But those kinds of things, to me, there are actual individual concrete acts done yeah. by actual people who need to be taken to task for it. Whereas if, yeah. it's, if you see it as a system or a stru structure, yeah. sorry, then it's kind of just sort of like out there. What, you know, who's gonna, how can you take on a structure? You're quite right. It, on face value, it, it looks like that, but it's actually much deeper than that. I've um, the, the two previous chief medical officer had a uh, it was at the Department of Health. So Liam Donaldson, he had a, an inquiry looking at racism in medicine. I was actually on that committee. I'm going back what 10, 12 years ago. Then the King's Fund also produced a report. There are lots of reports being produced. Uh, even recently, about two weeks ago, a report was produced by the Royal College of Psychiatrists highlighting the level of discrimination faced by black and Asian people working in the field of psychiatry. So it's not simply just simply down to I've ignored you in the interview process or I've not promoted you or I'm not giving you any opportunities. It's much deeper than that, and that's part of the problem. That okay, is, yeah. all right, thank you. I'll just bring in uh, Kony now. Yeah, yeah um, I'll go back to, I think, the original question which kicked off this section. Um, what is the actual driver in terms of anti-racism today? Is it equality or is it something else? Uh, I think it's a very important question. Uh, anybody who's looked at um, what passes for anti-racism at the moment could not have failed to see uh, the high level of celebrities um, who have suddenly got involved in anti-racist campaigning. Um, the question of anti-racism and show business uh, for me, it's, uh, it's quite interesting, given I have a background in, in also music production uh, and in, in working within that space. Uh, and uh, I remember the difficulties uh, of having, of trying to get people to actually engage in anti-racist campaigns uh, and how that now has shifted that uh, I have no doubt that many of the commercial agents in the West End are telling their um, uh, uh, artists that they better get their uh, anti-racist campaign going, otherwise they're not gonna be seen as relevant or credible. Um, so in terms of you know, the, the question of equality, for me, it's still the central question in terms of anti-racism. Regardless, I think what we are talking about a lot of the time is in fact recognition and identity and the recognition of different identities. Um, and that is something different. Uh, if we Look at the French Revolution. Uh, the French Revolution was a tremendously inspiring uh, act uh, in terms of its impact uh, worldwide. Uh, and certainly when we look at people like Toussaint Louverture uh, in Haiti, if we look at the slave revolts in Jamaica, uh, and if we consider uh, the emergence, uh, the, the kind of emerging working class in Britain, the French Revolution was hugely significant. Uh, indeed, I believe it's one of the um, leaders of the Vietnamese struggle who, when asked about it, um, uh, its impact uh, uh, in the 1960s, said it was um, too soon to tell. And, uh, and my view is that uh, that uh, notion of equality, fraternity, and illegality is, is still something that drives political movements uh, worldwide. Uh, the, the fact that in 2021, much of the discussion is no longer about uh, formal inequality before the law and the ability uh, before the law to be able to exercise uh, the rights that you're granted, but it's actually much more a discussion about whose identities uh, should have priority in terms of a hierarchy of identities is hugely problematic. And um, it, regardless of uh, even looking at the, the, the situation, uh, just to, to quote an example, the Sarah, Sarah Everard issue, about the relationship between women and the police and the difficulties of deciding whether or not you, know, you should approach a policeman. Well, I've got news for you. That's uh, something that the black communities and, and brown communities have had to deal with for decades. Uh, and I'm surprised that you know, in the media, that point hasn't been made more um, kind of uh, uh, readily available. In, in terms of the, the question of, uh, again, of this issue of identities and the gentleman that talked about uh, the nature of Irish racism uh, and the question of uh, even anti-Semitism, I think that uh, in different hi historical uh, epochs, the intensity of the discrimination changes. 
and in particular to the Irish question, I think that the uh, question of democratic rights uh, within the counties of Ireland is central to the question of Irish discrimination, which is why I wouldn't put it in the same bag uh, as what we're actually facing around the questions of identity and, and uh, other aspects of race. But certainly, in terms of the, the, the issues, um, uh, we'd need to actually look at it in its specific context. Um, so just uh, going on the other stuff, uh, in terms of uh, salaries and wages and conditions of young people, my point was actually to demonstrate that the uh, picture in terms of uh, the job market and labor market is changing. Uh, and as anti-racists and social scientists, we should never get bogged down into thinking that everything is fixed and that what we thought uh, was true in the 1980s is true of what's happening today. Uh, so there are certain sections where, in fact, I could quote you examples where there are, for example, Chinese uh, uh, laborers and Chinese workers and Indian workers who are actually earning more money uh, than the white equivalents. Uh, and that's something that's happened in, in recent years. And I, uh, I don't take that as a, a kind of generalization in terms of every aspect of the job market, but it's an interesting phenomenon to make a note of and to uh, just understand that things change, nothing stays the same. I, I, I think that, you know, I, I'm, in saying that, it's a really important thing to understand that race in itself is not fixed. It's not a fixed phenomenon. It shifts, it adapts, it changes, and attitudes change. I think there is a problem within the, the, the current anti-racist movement, or even you might prefer the race industry, that argues the point that actually nothing has changed in the last 50 uh, to 100 years, and that is simply not the case. Thank you, Kimi. Okay. We've got about 10 minutes, so I'm going to ask for people to try and keep it short. Uh, I'd like both of you to come back on the point or the question that was raised probably by Alka and somebody behind about division in today's anti-racist approach. Because in 1980, when people like me and other people here fought against deportations, police harassment, there was unity. You weren't fighting against each other. You were actually urging people to support you and stand up one-to-one you know, one -one against the state. Today, it pretty much feels, certainly in work-like situations, that you're pitching black people against white people. On the one hand, you've got black people who talk about their experiences, lived experiences, fine, no problem. But if there were any questions raised about the content of what they are saying, if there was any opposition to it, immediately you are asked to be silent, you are investigated. So what you have is within the workplace, on the one hand, while everyone is telling us to be open, to be transparent, the reality is you're creating a situation where people, especially white people, are fearful of saying anything. You know, uh, so you've got a really anxious, scared community here. And that isn't about fighting racism. It's just about creating divisions, which for me, I fear it's going to get worse. <laughs> Yeah, in a way, following on from that, I read something the other day which really, really deeply disturbed me, and I think very much relates to a lot of points made in this discussion. Because what this article argued was that the Martin Luther King moment was very much the exception in history. So as someone has already quoted, you know, famously, Martin Luther King, the black civil rights leader in the 1960s, said, what should matter is not the color of your skin, but the content of your character. So of course, there will be people different skin colors, different other, other characteristics. But the important thing is our common humanity. That was his argument. And what this article was arguing was that that is very much the exception in history. Because before Martin Luther King, there was the old-fashioned racism, which everyone in this room, I'm sure, knows and loathes, you know, very explicitly saying black people were inferior and white people were superior, completely grotesque. Uh, but it seems to me what's happening now is that we're having a reintroduction of racial thinking in a different form. So although it's posed very often in the language of anti-racism and in a very benign form, through the discussion of white privilege, for example, to me it seems to be reintroducing racial categories. And this discussion of equity, which I think is much bigger in the US and in Britain, although it's coming to Britain, 
saying what we should aim for is equity rather than equality. I, think, I could be wrong on this, but I think I'm right. I think even Joe Biden has said this in the US. And what, what this is saying is very explicitly that black and white people should be treated differently. People should be judged by the color of their skin, not by the content of their character. And I know, Pat, obviously, Patrick can come back on this. I know Patrick said that the ultimate aim for him anyway, and for some people, is still equality. So some people would argue this equity is a transitional thing. But to me, it seems that it, it is becoming really, really deeply ingrained. To me, I, I'm really fearful, as someone who's fought against racism all of my life, that we, we've now got a new form of racism emerging, but it's using the language of anti-racism. <laughs> Thank you. Um... Thanks, I totally agree with that, and, and I, I find myself in disagreement with Patrick. Patrick describes a thing where you knock down the barrier. That's fine, that's equality of opportunity. Equity is not that. Equity is quotas or equality of outcome. I also disagree with Patrick when he says, you know, political correctness has gone the other way. No, it hasn't. <laughs> it hasn't, right? You can teach about critical race theory in schools, but you should not teach it uncritically and teach it as if it is fact. And that is what is happening. And it's a real, real problem. So for example, it is smuggled into schools. It's now being recommended for Brighton and Hove uh, local authority. And sometimes it's called different things. Sometimes it's called diversity, equity, and inclusion. But in reality, what this means is something very different. It means equity, equality of outcome. You can't make that happen. And I think Patrick's whole thesis is, we don't have equality of outcome, therefore it must be racism. It must be structural racism that's causing that. I entirely disagree with that. There are many reasons why you get different outcomes, and they are not all about racism. I, 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 I'm unconvinced by the arguments that you've made about where the structural racism exists. And I do think that we have got to stick, and this is my final point, Alka, mm -hmm. that we've got to go by the liberal scientific method of making knowledge and teaching in schools, not introducing diversity, equity, inclusion, which are just fixed kind of outcomes, and you're substituting scientific knowledge for every voice matters, you know, okay. just because okay. it's from a minority group. So I find myself okay. really disagreeing with Patrick. Thank, thank you. We're coming to the close of the session now, and in a minute I'm going to ask Patrick and Kunli to sum up with a few minutes of your sure. closing statements. Before I do, I'm very much aware that we've had a very... The, the, the lots of people kind of are disagreeing with Patrick, and I would really love to hear from anybody who is sitting there quietly thinking, hmm, actually, I think I quite agree with Patrick, but I'm not sure how to say it. So, uh, I mean... Patrick's a strong man. He's not going to be devastated if, if there isn't. He can hold I'll, his I'll own. I'll survive. I'll in the but is there anybody who, think, who thinks that actually, you know, just saying, it's all very well saying individual character, but we don't just live as individuals. We live in a society and there are institutions and don't we sometimes face um, power, um, you know, um, blockages or barriers? So if you think that, or even if you half think it, would you put your hand up? Well, I mean, I was just raising my hand to, do you agree with Patrick? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I did raise my hand for a question earlier, so I don't know if I'm allowed to... Could you say why you agree with Patrick? That would be really helpful, and then you can ask your question quickly. Well, um, just, uh, I just... Uh, um, I think for one thing, um, the gentleman who just spoke may have misunderstood because he didn't see the same cartoon. And Patrick just said, "Oh, does everyone see that? You know, that cartoon has been around the internet and didn't quite explain it." But you know, there's three panels. One where, um, yeah, so it's not. You would know that it's not equity to take away the barrier. That equity was the one with the boxes where uh, the shortest person gets two. Um, and the tallest person gets none. Um, but uh, okay. So equity yeah. is when you give yeah. some, you know, say, like, equity is like affirmative action. Yes, okay. Uh, There's a case for affirmative action. But removing the barrier is what okay. Patrick was talking about, which was the third panel and not the second. That's lovely. <laughs> okay. Can we now come back to the panel for your very quick, I'm really sorry, very quick final comments? So, Patrick and then Kunli? Sure. 
Listen, guys, you're not, we're not going to agree today, let's face it. Let's see. <laughs> so that's cool. That's cool. It's all good. It's all good. Um, I, mean, the, the, I mean, in terms of all the, your comments and, the, and all the comments put together, um, as I said before, anti-racism is a, is, a, is a broad church based on your worldview, your politics and identity. And there have been shifts and changes. I'm going back to the point that the, um, the, the lady raised about white people being almost like... Um, they're not allowed to speak out. With all due respect, a lot of black and brown people have not been allowed to speak out. It's only because of Black Lives Matter there's been a massive explosion of people wanting to talk about the experiences of racism, discrimination in the workplace. And I know this because I've been on so many uh, uh, events in terms of within the civil service and even in the private sector. I've been invited to quite a few events with top chip, top chip companies where B B staff networks have started to talk to direct to the senior management team about their own experience of race and discrimination because if they did, they'll get shut down or they'll, get, they'll lose their job. And it's been suppressed for such a long time. What we need to do is to recalibrate those conversations where white people can talk about stuff, black and brown people can talk about stuff and create some a space for those conversations. That's what needs to happen now, basically. Otherwise, it will be polarised. Um, that will happen. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the conversation that you kind of challenged me on, it's a fair point, it's your, your worldview perspective, but I think it kind of reminds me of the whole kind of conversations around um, the, the, why the Enlightenment period was really important to Britain during eight, in the, and Britain and Europe during the 18th century. Philosophy, science, the, the, all that kind of stuff, while at the same time, slavery was still happening. So everyone was talking about the Enlightenment period, how it was the greatest mm. moment in human humanity around art, science, religion, yet the same people were involved in the slave trade. And that is the issue that we have today. We're not being honest and upfront about the history of Britain and how it has an impact today on those barriers. And the final slide in that diagram, when you remove it, it's called liberation. And that's what we should be working towards. Liberate our minds, our bodies, and liberation to be free. But unfortunately, certain people are free and certain people are not free today. Thank you, Patrick. I'm glad you brought in freedom there, Patrick, at the end. Couldn't leave. Yeah, I think that um, the aspiration for liberation is a very positive one. Uh, but unfortunately, what I'm experiencing is a, a, an anti-racist movement that actually curtails uh, the level of discussion, actually puts limits on people in terms of their imagination, and uh, prescribes prior to um, having any kind of discourse what the outcome should be. Um, I, and I definitely... Uh, I'm of the view that we should have open and frank discussions. I think that, um, you know, it's been referenced in the discussion, Kemi Badenoch. I've got a lot of time for Kemi Badenoch. But when Kemi, in her statement, talked about bringing in lawyers uh, to uh, prohibit um, uh, uh, the discussion of critical race theory in schools, I think she was wrong, right? And we have to be open enough to even look at every aspect in of itself and, and, and make the, the kind of analysis that's open and honest, even if it means that sometimes we get it wrong. I think at the moment, uh, in terms of the, the discourse around anti-racism, particularly in workplaces, there's the fear of actually asking very basic questions because nobody wants to be singled out as being uh, racist or indeed being seen as ignorant. Uh, the question of uh, you know, social etiquette and how we actually form relationships now is being disrupted, I think, by um, the rigidity in terms of the absence of debate and discussion on these things, which is a free-flowing thing. It's not, it shouldn't be prescriptive. And people should be allowed to ask stupid questions like, well, how do you, ma how do you uh, measure white privilege? And does my friend who's mixed race, is, is, do they have half white privilege and the other half they're actually non-privileged? There are some really fundamental questions we're not asking about this stuff uh, we just slap it up and people just uh, assume that these doctors, professors and academics, you know, are, are talking sense. We need to be much more critical. And with that, I'm just going to finish on a real challenge uh, for us, which is, uh, can we actually construct uh, a diversity or race uh, course, which is actually puts humanity back at the center of that discussion? Uh, and that's the challenge. 
can we please thank our speakers, both of them. I think it's been an absolutely fascinating discussion and I want more of it.